wonderful, fabulous work. And we want to invite him to the platform right now to come and break the bread. And we are excited. So would you give him a warm harbor welcome right now? Mike, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Jeff on the count of... On the count of three, so my name's Jeff, so on the count of three, I want you to tell me your name. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. Love it. Got all of them. It's so good to be with you. Um, we, I am just honored to be here with you. I have just heard about this wonderful, wonderful uh, church, and of course, Pastor Mike and Kelly. It's just an honor to be with them, and uh, you know, they have been here as your pastors for over 28 years. Some of you were not born when they come to, your pa- to be the pastor here in the church. And that says a lot. And uh, you want to know, you want to know how he stayed 28 years. You want to know how that is? Because, you know, most tra- pastors only stay about maybe three to four years. And uh, what we figured out is that, you know, when people wanted me to go, I stayed. And when I felt like going, I stayed. And I just determined this, and maybe you have too, Mike, is that it's always easier for people to move their membership than me to pack my furniture up and move in a U-Haul. <laughs> so anyway, it's just an honor to be with you. I want to tell you, I, have, I was honored today to drive down with my pastor. I call him my pastor, Johnny Young, sitting right here. Johnny, would you stand up and wave at everybody right here? This is, pastor, this is Johnny Young. <clears throat> He's a guy that's not on staff that's my pastor because he can tell me the truth. If I paid him, he couldn't tell me the truth. So he tells me the truth. And anyways, it's just an honor to be with him. I want to share something with you. And then I've got something I want to, um, I really feel like I brought a word uh, tonight for all of you. I mean, for every person here. Matter of fact, somebody told me, you know, I have been called slick sometimes. You know, I don't know if that was a good thing or not. Somebody's called me fly before. But somebody called a slick, what was Slay. Slay. They said, your clothes are slay. <laughs> slay. So I can't, I can't wait. I'm going to get home. This, I'll get home this morning, probably about 1.30, and I'm going to wake my wife up and say, you looking at slay. This is a this is slay. I hope she didn't teach me a bad word. I don't know. Is it a bad word? Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All of, everybody that's over like uh, 30, like, I don't know. Yeah. I want to share something with you uh, before I preach, and that I have written an, another book that I would love to sh- share with you. I've written a book on something that everybody needs, but nobody wants to talk about. And let me tell you something. Before I tell you the title, men is thin. Men read thin. That's why I started writing them. But I wrote a book on forgiveness, and this is what it, the subtitle is, How to Forgive What You Can't Forget. How to forgive what you can't forget. I, God showed me something about forgiveness, and it was this. He revealed this to me, that forgiveness is not forgetting. Because if I could forget, I wouldn't need to forgive. And you know something about forgiveness, too? You know, Simon Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, said, Okay, Lord, said, I think I'll just give some, forgive somebody seven times a day. Is that enough? And Jesus said, No, how about, uh, how about 70 times seven, about 490 times a day? Why did he say that? Because you're going to, when you say, I forgive someone, it's not a one-time thing. Because that might have happened five years ago, but that thought about what they did is going to pop back up in your mind. Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? And all of a sudden, it pops up in your mind, and all of a sudden, you have them feelings all over again, right? And so you thought, oh, I want God, I need to forgive them. No, 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 you forgave them then, but you got to forgive them again. So forgiveness is this. Forgiveness is choosing to release the feelings of hurt, pain, and disappointment, and resentment. So forgiveness has to happen. So I even wrote a chapter in here that I've never heard anybody talk about, and it's going to sound crazy. I know it's going to sound so uh, crazy, but forgiving God. It's a chapter about forgiving God. Now, God's never done anything wrong, never, ever... So you say, how can you forgive God? Well, there's a lot of things that happen in our life that we, we blame God for. We're like, God, if you would have stepped in, that wouldn't happen. 
And a lot of people hold on to that resentment against God, and they can't love God with all their heart as long as they're holding on to that. So again, it's so many things about forgiveness in here. Uh, it's $10, by the way, uh, so uh, Johnny will be back there at our table. My pastor will be back there. Don't you pass my pastor by without saying hello to him. Uh, but he'll be back there. And so if it's interest to you, I want to share it with you. Would you do me a favor? Would you stand? I actually gave you an outline, so if you don't have a Bible, you can just grab that outline. I think that we have that. The Word of God, the most powerful thing in the world we're about to partake of. Amen, everybody? Amen. It says this. The Bible says this in Acts 10, 38. Listen to what it says. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the, what, everybody? Holy Spirit and and power, and he went around, what's those next two words? Doing good, and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was what, everybody? With With him. Would you do me a favor? Would you just hold your hands out like this? Would you bow your heads and repeat this prayer after me? Dear God, God, I'm here tonight. tonight. I open my mind and my heart. Fill me, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, before you're seated, turn around and tell someone it's so good to see them tonight, and you can be seated. <laughs> Why don't you just go ahead and turn to your second choice? <laughs> tell them it's good to see them. <laughs> I have, I have something that I want to share with you tonight that I, I think we can remember. You know, I learned a few years ago that people are not going to remember a whole lot about what I say. So I've tried to narrow my sermons down to just a few words. Now, you said, great, because he's going to tell us two, two few words and we're going to go home. <laughs> no. But I want to narrow it down, this one that I want to share with you, to two words. Do good. Would you repeat those two words with me? Let's repeat the sermon. Are you ready? Come on, let's read it. Do good. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to help me preach this sermon, because what is our sermon, everybody? Do good. Do good. I feel like that the title of the message I have is How to Have the Best Life. I just read to you in Acts 10, 38, how that Jesus went around doing good, powered by the Holy Spirit. So I want to take this verse and walk you through something that I really believe, if you will put into practice, it will change your life. I've been watching it, uh, Johnny and I have been watching it over the last two years. Of these two words, we've been watching it change people in our congregation. It's, It's been changing people in our community. And it's just make, bringing change. And so tonight, I want to I bring a deposit to you that you actually can take this and because I believe that God wants to use this church to change all of this South Georgia and North Florida region. Amen, everybody? I, listen, I didn't come tonight to a church that was just to have church. I come to a church that's alive, and that's what you are. And you're you're making a difference. So tonight, I want to help you. So the first thing I have on your outline is this. If you want to have the best life, the first thing to do is, number one, is ask the Holy Spirit to fill you daily. Amen, everybody? The anointing of God's presence with you and His power is available to you. That's what the Holy Spirit's all about. Look, matter of fact, Acts 1 and 8, look at it with me. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So notice he said you're going to receive power. And let me tell you something. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to help you do the things that are right. Amen, everybody? Like today when I was driving down here, I thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit. Because I was on one of the interstates and somebody, somebody, somebody tried to run me off the road. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I don't like it. Matter of fact, I have a little rage, road rage in me. 
And so, see, if it was not for the Holy Spirit today, I wouldn't be here now. Because if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, I've watched just enough NASCAR to know how to put them people in the wall. I know how to do it. And all that was jumping up inside of me, but the Holy Spirit said, Jeff, you're going to preach, preach some great people tonight at the harbor. Now, you just got to be still. And Johnny sure was glad, too. <laughs> now, talking about the Holy Spirit, people ask me, what is the Holy Spirit? Let's explain this Holy Spirit because, I don't know, maybe not here, but in my area, people are like, what are you talking about? And when you say Holy Ghost, it really freaks them out. they like, what are you talking about, Casper? No, 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 I'm not talking about Casper the Ghost. Some of you got to Google what Casper the Ghost is, all right? That's back in our day. But I want to show you here, here what the, I want you to do something with me. Would you take your hand and just hold it right in front of your face? Everybody, just everybody, humor me. Just do this. On the count of three, we're going to blow on our hands. Now, if you did not brush your teeth, don't you do this. <laughs> we will trust you, all right? If your hand's down right now, I'm thinking you didn't brush your teeth, all right? So hold it up. On the count of three, we're going to do it. You ready? One, two, three. All right. Yeah, that's good. Some of you are, <laughs> it's okay. But did you, did you feel the wind hit your hand? You did it. I'll do it again. You know what? <laughs> We're blowing it on our hand, but I don't see anything. Thank God we don't see anything, right? That would be really bad breath. It'd be a fog. But we don't see anything, but we feel it. That's the way Jesus described the Holy Spirit. He says, like the wind. You don't, see, you don't see him. You only feel and see the effects of him. Amen, everybody? Amen. Now, see, what you don't see is that God is working in you. The Holy Spirit's working in you, and you don't see it, but other people around you see it. Yeah. Let me tell you. There's a, there's a lady asked me, she said, would you mind performing the wedding of my daughter? I said, well, you know what? We'll just see if we can't make that happen. And she said, you know, my daughter's graduating law school. <clears throat> she's going to take the bar, and uh, she's going to get married. I said, great. So I agreed to do that wedding. And I said, but, you know, I want to meet with your uh, daughter first and future son-in-law. And so my wife and I go sit down at a restaurant and we, were, and we happened to see them. They sent me a picture of her. So she's coming in the restaurant, but she's walking like this. Like she's mad at somebody. She comes and she snatches that chair out and sits down. And her, her fiancé sits down beside her. I thought, man, I done made a lawyer mad. I don't want to make no lawyer mad. You know what I'm saying? They'll, they'll, have, they'll sue me for eating the wrong food. Okay, you don't think like that, but I do. And so I said to her, I said, are, are you okay? She said, I'm okay. She's, but she looked at me and said, what did you do to my daddy? I said, ma'am, your daddy and I are cool. I did nothing. I promise you, I didn't, I didn't do nothing to your daddy. She said, yes, you did. I said, ma'am, I promise you I haven't done anything to your dad. Don't sue me. <laughs> she said, what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. She said, my daddy used to never talk to anybody he surely wouldn't get, pick up no Bible, and he surely would not pray. But I want you to know that every day that I go to my daddy's house, I see my dad. He's so happy talking to everybody. He's got a Bible in his lap, and I hear him praying. I said, ma'am, I want you to know something. I still say I did nothing to your dad. But there's something called the Holy Spirit that's got a hold of your dad, and it's changed his life. Amen, everybody. Amen. So you need the Holy Spirit, amen? God, He's working in you, and you may be the last person to notice it, but everybody else is noticing what He's doing in you. Amen, everybody. Now, what's our two words? Do good. Do good. That's right. Do good. So we've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. That's what Jesus walked around. He walked around with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, 
Here we go. It gets better. Number two is this, is do good no matter how you feel. Now, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit to do good, and people recognized God in him because he went around doing good. And so I want to read a passage to you here. I'm going to read this passage to you, and I'm going to tell you before I read it, I don't like it. If I had my way, I'd just rip it right out of the Bible. As a matter of fact, I would tell you that for years I read the Bible through every year. Well, I'd say it took me about 14 months to read it through. And every time I'd come to this passage, whether it would be in Luke's gospel or Matthew or whatever, when I come to this passage, I'd just read over it because I didn't like it. Is there any Bible verses, any verse in the Bible that you don't like? There should be. You say, well, what do you mean, Pastor Jeff? Well, I, I don't like that they're there. I got to obey them, though, like my parents' rules. There's some things they told me when I was a kid growing up. You got to do this. I didn't like the rule, but it was what was good for me. Amen, everybody? Watch this one. Here we go. Are you ready for this? Jesus is speaking here. Jesus said, but I tell you who hear me, love your what, everybody? Okay, now you, you follow me right now. Okay, is anybody, any, listen, take your little halo off and put it under your seat. Anybody tracking with me? Love your enemy. Now, come on, somebody. They just posted all kind of stuff about me on social media, and I'm supposed to love them. Yeah, I got some love for them. I got some love, all right. I'm going to share some love. I like the right hand of fellowship. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His brother said, I like it. Yeah. Now, notice this. He said, but I tell you, hear me, love your enemies. What's those next two words? Do good. Do good. That's our sermon. Do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Now, how can I love somebody I don't even like? Anybody ever thought about that? Jesus said, love them. I don't even like them, Jesus. Okay, let's just move on. <laughs> that's, that's what I don't, moved on, right? Here we go. Watch this. 1 John 3 and 18, I'm going to show this to you. Dear children, let us not love with what, everybody? Our speech, but with what? And in, and in truth. So what he's saying is this is that the, the, this love that God's talking about is not a feeling, everybody. It's not a feeling. We are so jacked up. Like, our love songs are all lust songs. They're not love songs. In our culture today, people are jacked up when it comes to love. They don't even know what love is anymore. Like I said, our love songs are lust songs. Oh, you don't believe it. If you want my body and you think I'm sexy, come on, baby, let me know. Oh, yeah, because I'm what, Mike? What am I? What am I? Slave, sled, slut, I don't know, something. That's what I am. Slay, slay, that's what I am. Mess with me, I'm slay. I'm going to go in my house tonight and tell my wife, wake her up, I'm slay. That's who I am. So what I'm trying to tell you is this, as though you forgot how biblical love is nothing about feelings. It's not that, it's about actions. What are our two words, everybody? Do good. do good, do good. Jesus said, love your enemy. How, everybody? By doing good, do good. So love is not a feeling. Love is an action. And you have to understand that if you're going to love people. Now, let me explain the difference to you, okay, between, see, in our culture, we think we got to, first comes like, and then comes love, right? In other words, we got to like somebody, and then we love somebody. But we can't love them before we like them. But that's not biblical love. Biblical love, this is what biblical love is. Here, did I put on your outline? Biblical love is doing good for another person no matter how I feel. That's what biblical love is. Bible love is saying I'm going to do good no matter how I feel. So in our culture today, we said, you know what? Well, I got to like you before I love you. No, 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 no. Here's the difference between like and love. If you and I, if I just like you, and then we, we, we come into the parking lot here at the church, 
and you, you make me mad. You do something to make me mad. And then you drive out of here and you go out on the highway right there and you get hit by a semi and your car's over in a ditch and it's on fire and I'm behind you. If I just like you, I'm going to go. They got what they deserved. <laughs> uh, if I just like you, but if I love you, no matter if I like you or not, if I love you and I'm behind you, your car gets hit, it's on fire, guess what? I'm going to pull my vehicle over, not because I like you, but because I love you, and I'm going to pull you out of the car. I might let the door hit you on the way out, but I'm going to pull you out of the car because that's what love does. It's not about a feeling. See, this is what I want you to know, that mature people understand this. That loving actions toward a person bring loving feelings. So many people today in our culture, I want to, oh, when I start, well, I want to feel it, baby. I want to feel the fire burn. Well, let me tell you something. Many of you had the fire burning when you were dating before you got married. But you know why? Because you were doing all that good stuff and it kept the fire going. Once you got married, you quit doing the good stuff, the fire went out. Because what we forgot was this. We forgot that, that feelings follow action, not the other way around. You don't feel it, then do it. No, you, you do it, then feel it. Amen, everybody? Oh, okay, I don't think anybody's listening to me right now. It's not about a feeling. It's about love. It's about love. Now, what I want you to know is this. Love is doing good for another person no matter how I feel. It's amazing how we try to get love, isn't it? We want someone to love us, so when, when they, we don't feel like they're loving us, so we all say, well, you know what? They're not loving me, so I'm not going to love them. You know what? I'll just, I ain't going to talk to them for a week. I'm going to unfriend them. That's right. I'm going to block all their posts. And it's amazing how we try to do unloving things to become more loved. Amen, everybody? Amen. Boy, he's preaching now, isn't he? That's right. He's preaching now. What I want you to know as followers of Jesus, you don't wait until you feel good before you do good. You do good, and then you feel good. It feels good to do good, everybody. You are called by Almighty God not to, not to just sit around and wait for something good to come your way before you act. No, you as people of God, if you're going to change this community and your life's going to matter and you're going to have a better life, you can't wait and say, well, when they do something for me, I'll do something for them. No, no, no. Jesus Christ has called you to look for every opportunity in, the, in this community and in your own home to do good. That's the message. What is our message, everybody? Do good. What's our message, everybody? Do good. That's our message is that you have to do good. Now, look, let's go ahead and let's get back in the Bible because let's find out if it's true or not. Here we go. Acts 26 and 20. Paul is saying, he says, I preach first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea and also to the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God. Now, watch this part. And prove they have changed by the what, everybody? Good things they do. Oh. In other words, he said, if you got saved, you're going to start doing good. You're going to start doing good. And see, the problem that we have in our culture today is we all want to demand change, but Jesus said you're to be the change. Amen, everybody. You're to, you're to quit saying, well, somebody ought to do something about that, and somebody ought to do something about that. No, 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 no. Jesus said you do good. You become the change that you desire. Amen, everybody. Amen. You be the change. You be the change. Every day when you get out of the bed, the first question you need to ask yourself is, what good can I do today? It'll change your world. It'll change your relationship with your brother and sister. It'll change your relationship with your parents, and it'll change your relationship with your teacher, and it'll change your relationship with your boss, and it'll change your relationship with your wife and your husband. Shoot, it'll even change your relationship with your mother-in-law. <laughs> Woo! That man's preaching now. It'll change it. Number three, the third thing is this. What's our two words, everybody? You're good. You're good. 
Number three is bring healing to those the devil is hurting. This is what Jesus did. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He went around doing good, and he began to heal those that were all that were under the power of the devil. And God has called you to do that as well. Matthew 5, 14 and 6, through 16. You are the light of the what, everybody? He's talking to you. You're it. You're lit. Look at there. See the Holy Spirit's in the room. He just gave me the, a word, lit. You lit. They understood me, everybody. You're it. You're the only light that people's going to see. They're never going to walk into this room that's lit until you light up their world. And you got to be lit. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, in other words, he said, like you just go and light a lamp. You turn, you turn the switch, the lamp comes on. You flip the switch, and the lights, the room's lit up. That's what you do when you walk into a room. In the same way, let your light so shine before who, everybody? For men, and that means mankind, men and women, that they may see your what, everybody? Good. There it is. There it is again. You got to do good. And praise your Father in heaven. It's the good that we do that removes the scales from people's eyes. Not everybody can see Jesus the way you do. Not everybody views the Bible the way you do because they have scales over their eyes. But the Bible says that when you keep doing good, and when you do good, you're shining the light of Jesus Christ. And as you do that, all of a sudden, that light begins to do a little surgery on their eyes. And it begins to remove the scales, and because of your good actions and the good that you do all the time, they want to ask you, why do you do that all the time? And because you say this, that it's not me, it's my, it's my Father in heaven who sent His Holy Spirit inside of me, and it's Jesus Christ that is alive and well, and that's why I do what I do. Amen, everybody. All right. All right, we're we getting there. What's our... What, What's our two words, everybody? Good. Do good. That's what they are. That's the message. Do good. You're getting good at preaching it, too. When we do good in our world, everybody asks us questions. Everybody is asking, who is your God that would make you do this good or coerce you to do this good? Look at the next verse with me. Romans 12, 18 and 21. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at what, everybody? Peace. With everyone. See that? Live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you. Listen. In other words, there's some people you can't live at peace with because they won't let you live at peace. Amen. So it says, as far on your part of it, you're, going to, you're still going to live at peace with them, even though if they're not at peace with you, you're going to be at peace. Now, here we go. Watch this. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, watch this. On the contrary, because that's what we want to do. When, somebody's, when somebody hits us, we want to hit them back, right? Shoot, let me tell you something. My son was about two years old, and he was in a church nursery. And, you know, we were the youth pastors, so, you know, we were at the youth pastor of this church, and a kid bit him right on the arm, left, every, left all, the, all the teeth print, all of them right there in his arm. And so we went to Sunday dinner after church. We went to my mother-in-law's house, and my mother-in-law is the sweetest lady you ever met. Sweetest lady you ever met. 
But she saw those marks on my son's arm. She said, what happened? He said, well, he got bit today. My mother-in-law took the sweetest lady you ever met, best Christian you ever met in your life, took my son to the side. Here he is about two and a half years old. She said, Tyler, if somebody bites you, you bite them back. <laughs> because that's the way all of us are raised, right? Most of us, if they hit you, hit them back. And so that's why he said, on the contrary, because that's our nature. That's what we want to do, right? Right? Okay, don't you, don't you look at me like that. You ain't got your wings yet. You ain't turned into no angel. All right. Can't fool me. I've been pastor too long. On the contrary, he goes, if your enemy is hungry, what do we do, everybody? What's our two words? Here we go. Watch this. Here we go. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. What's our two words, everybody? In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now watch this. Do not be overcome by what, everybody? But overcome with? Did you see that? That's change, everybody. That's how you change it. If the devil's poisonous venom is evil then God's anti-venom is doing good. Did you hear that? If the devil's venom in this world is evil, then God's anti-venom is when his people do good in spite of all the evil around them. If you will keep doing good, even in an evil culture, and an evil society, he says that the good will overcome the evil. Amen? Either you're going to be overcome by evil, or you're going to overcome evil with good. Amen, everybody? All right, it's time. It's time. I want to show you. I have something under here I want to show you. Oh, these ping pong balls right here. <clears throat> these ping pong balls represent evil. All the bad things that go on in our world. Here it is right here. People murdering, hurting people, lying, cheating, stealing, all the bad things that you can think of that people do, here it is. And this water represents doing good. And so what we want to do if we're going to get evil out of our own lives, the first thing we got to do is, what's our sermon, everybody? Yes. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do good. But see, what's happening? Do you notice what's happening as I'm putting the water in? What's happening, everybody? They're rising, aren't they? And so maybe you're fighting with your mom and your dad, and you don't want to use like, you know, I, I don't want to be in this house anymore. And, but you decide that, you know, no matter what's going on with them, I decide that I'm going to, what's our two words, everybody? Good. Do good. So I'm just going to do good no matter what they do. And look what's happening, everybody. Things are beginning to rise, aren't they? And in that marriage that you're in, you say, you know, I don't know about her and I don't know about him. And, and it's just like, oh, we're just two different people anymore. Well, you decide that I don't know what they're going to do, but I know what I'm going to do because God said do good. I'm going to do good. What's our two words, everybody? Yeah. Do good. And you just decide that you're going to do good. Now, look what's happening here. Are you with me? Watch this. We've done this good. Now, look what you see how all the evil starting to rise, right? This is why when you start to do good in your house, it gets worse before it gets better. Every time, dear God Almighty, I'm about to preach. Every time that you decide I'm going to follow God and I'm going to do good, it seems like that things start getting worse before they get better. And the reason is, is because everything's rising to the top. 
And most people will stop right there. They'll say, oh, I've tried this praying stuff. It don't work. I've tried this doing good stuff. It don't work. i tried this Christian stuff, and it don't work. And the reason is they stop when it's all right here. But that's not you, and that's not you, and that's not you, and that's not you. Because after tonight, we understand God's power and His Spirit. And we understand at this point, the devil begins talking to us and saying, Don't do it anymore. Quit. Give up. Don't try anymore. But that's not who you are. Because, you, see, your communities, the devil is hoping that you stop because this church is right here. You're lifting it up. You're lifting everything up. You, you, man, you, you are about to have breakthrough like you've never seen before. This church is about to do amazing things like you've never seen before. You, you, listen, you got to build this building. You got to. You can't because just staying here will keep everything right here. You got to make room for more. You got to share Jesus with your friends. You got to invite more people. Why? Because that's doing good. But the devil will do everything he can to stop you. Well, I ain't going back to that church. A pastor preached like that. I ain't going back. He said something I don't like. <laughs> Reminds me of my dad going to the doctor. My dad went to the doctor. He said, Doc, what's, what did the doc say, Dad? He said, well, he said, my sugar's up, my blood pressure's up, and, and I need to lose weight. I said, well, what you going to do? He said, I'm going to get me another doctor. You got to help me preach, everybody. What's our words? Do good. Do good. We're on the edge of breakthrough. And so tonight we decide that even though it doesn't feel good, we're going to do good because it feels good if you'll keep doing good. It feels good to do good, everybody. It feels good to do good. So what are we going to keep doing to have breakthrough, everybody? What are we going to do? We're going to do good. What are we doing, everybody? We're doing good. 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 When you keep doing good, it's amazing what the good does that you can't do. You got to keep, you got to stay in the, in the worship team. You got to stay in small group. You got to stay on the parking lot team. You got to stay in the nursery. Why? Because you're doing good. And the more you do good, the more it changes everything. You say, Pastor Jeff, well, there's still, there's still some stuff there. Yeah, it is. And there's no more. No more. Oh, we might have a little more here. Let's see if this helps it. Oh, come on. We done done all the good we can do. We can't do no more good. That's all I can do. And there's still stuff there. That's all right. Because that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He does the good that you can't do. So what are you waiting on? You know, tonight you've got the message. You know you've said it over and over. Now when you leave this place, you go home and you do good. Don't you wait till you show up to school tomorrow. Don't wait till your job tomorrow. No, you teenagers go home tonight and shock your mom and daddy to death. Go in and, and wash a dish. Take out the trash. Glory to God. They're going to they gonna call this church and say, what have you done to my child? You dads go home, pick up your dirty underwear. Florida. Yes. Mm, I'm preaching where you're living now, aren't I? Mm -mm -mm. I'm scared to say anything about the ladies. I'm scared. I'm scared. I, you know, it's not a long way to my truck, but I don't think I'd make it. I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. <laughs> you do good. I want to tell you this story, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. 
<laughs> Can I go out that door? That's what I'm just trying to find my way out. There was a missionary by the name of A.W. Milam who lived in the early 1900s. And he was committed to sharing the gospel with the unchurched people groups of the world. And he became part of what was known as the one-way missionaries. Every time that they would get ready to go on a journey, they would pack their belongings and put them in a coffin because they knew they weren't coming back. And A.W. Milan began to sail to the, in the South Pacific into to the New Hybrides down there, these islands. They were unchurched. It was people that, as a matter of fact, every missionary that had been there had only lived just a short time because the natives, as soon as they got off the boats, would kill them. And he knew that he probably was going to die. But he felt so passionate about doing good and that people need to hear about Jesus. They need to risk his life. And so he set sail with all everything he had in that coffin. And when he got off the boat and the boat set sail, he began to take that coffin onto the island and something happened. He began to do good, to do good. And something amazing happened is that that good that he was doing began to spread through the island and, and somehow the tribal chief showed him favor. And he began to share Jesus with all those leaders. And over a period of years, almost 30 years, not only did he lead that island to Jesus, but all the other islands close by received Jesus Christ. And he died a natural death after 30 years. The natives seen a person do good no matter how they felt. They took him to the center of the island in that coffin he brought. They dug a hole and they buried him. And the natives made, a, made like a big plaque to go right there where his coffin's at in the center of the island. And it said this, When he came, there was no light. But when he left, there was no darkness. And I just believe here in this community I believe that, Kelly. Like, I believe that. That God brought you here 28 years ago. And he's given you all these people, this mass army of people, to go in this community and to do good. Do good when the budget's low. Do good when people are saying bad things against you. Do good no matter how you feel. Do good in the good times. Do good in the bad times. Do good all the time. And if you continue to do what you're doing, you need to do the good. That God is going to do something in this whole region that, not, that no one thought was possible. God's going to do it through you. I drove over 200 miles today. I'll drive 200 miles back. To, and I've come to tell you this, that God's calling is on you. 
It's on you. It's not for somebody else. It's not for the pastor. It's not for the worship pastor. It's not for, for anybody else. It's not for the people that are just calling themselves pastor and are on staff. It's for you. God has called you, and he wants to release an anointing in you so that you can do good, and that good, the good you do is going to change the people around you. Do good. When he came, there was no light. But when he left, there was no darkness. What do you want to be said about you? If you're in this room tonight, today, and you say, Jeff, I want the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want it on my life to do good that I can help change the world in which I live, the community in which I live. If that's you, I want you to stand right now. Just stand up right now if that's you. I want, I want it. I want it. I want the power of the Holy Spirit to anoint me to do good because you're going to need the anointing because when they're saying all kinds of bad things against you, your mother's words are going to come back. Bite them back! But the Holy Spirit's going to say, no, we're going to do good that we can keep moving it up. And we're not going to stop when it starts getting worse. Amen, everybody? Amen. We're going to keep on till we have breakthrough, baby. Now, I want to pray for you tonight because I'm believing that God has sent me here to tell you that revival is on the way. A renewal is on the way. A refilling is on the way. People's life. This community is going to be changed. All of a sudden, Jesus is going to be everywhere, everybody. Let's pray. Dear God, I've, today I've shared the best, of, with my, the best of my ability that you've called us, oh God. You've called these people here at Harbor, God, that they would be a harbor for those lost souls. And God, the beacon that shines out, the flashing light, the lighthouse, is what they do, not what they say. And so, Heavenly Father, I'm asking you now as I stretch my hands over them that tonight, God, you would give them a supernatural anointing. Holy Spirit, that you would remind them of these two words, to do good. To do good. And every circumstance, do good. And God, watch what you will do. I leave this anointing, I release it in the name that is above every name has all authority of heaven and earth, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.